The details of Canada's 2023 federal budget are released. I'm Marco Perry. Welcome to the Perry Platform. This week, the federal government unveiled their 250-page budget plan. And yes, you can find that online on their website if you're interested in some light reading. Finance Minister Christia Freeland projected a deficit about $10 billion higher than initially forecasted. And they attribute that due to the economic conditions that we see. There will be $43 billion in net new spending over the next six years. And as a consequence, the federal debt is going to hit $1.18 trillion. And that's trillion with a T. A thousand billions. Now, a number that big for a country as small as ours in terms of population is concerning. Just imagine for a second that your interest rate is something like 2% on that trillion dollar debt. The just the, just the amount we'd pay in interest annually is 20 billion dollars servicing that debt. Can we afford that? What's going to happen if the interest rates rise on that? What's going to happen if we continue to stockpile debt? Could we end up in a situation where almost a quarter of our spending is going to just servicing the debt? How about 50%? How about all of our spending? These things are possible. Uncontrolled debt accumulation is an issue for a country, especially when we don't have any feasible ways of paying that down in the short term. To be so indebted, especially when those debtors are oftentimes other countries around the world, is a mistake, and you really do have to think about if the pros outweigh the cons there. Now, there are lots of things that do need spending in Canada, but it seems to me that the issue is uncontrolled, untargeted, and inefficient spending. We do spend a lot of money in Canada, but perhaps we're not optimizing for the places that will have the most amount of impact for the average Canadian. And we'll go through the details of this budget, but it's clear to me the number seems right, but the things we're spending on seem wrong. A basic economic concept creeps in here, and that's opportunity cost. Every dollar that we spend in one area is a dollar not spent in another. So, there are three main priorities for this federal budget. They say healthcare and dental, and dental really is the crux of it, affordability, and clean energy for the economy. So, Here are some of the things that are happening. First of all, there will be a one-time hike to the GST rebate, which will provide up to $467 for families or $234 for singles, and that's due to things like the rising cost of groceries. Now, that's going to cost taxpayers $2.5 billion. And here's one thing I have to point out. I am no fan of one-time Band-Aid solutions. What is a one-time payout to a family of $400 realistically going to do? That family might be kept afloat for the next month or two, but they're going to be back in the same situation in the near future. That $2.5 billion could be more effectively spent tackling the root issue. The one thing I hate about government budgets is they rarely do that. They'll slap on a band-aid, they'll pander as if it's going to do anything, and they'll accept the public goodwill that getting a check from them is going to generate. But many people don't realize this is actually a silly approach to problem solving. You're just kicking the can down the road, and you're doing so while racking up a massive debt. Now, the next thing is $13 billion over five years to implement dental care plans for families earning less than $90,000, and that's household income. Now, this one's interesting because obviously dental care is important, and there are many families who couldn't afford it which is a big issue. Typically, Canadians look to insurance companies to get that, but we do have to bring back the concept of opportunity cost. What is the most pressing need for the average Canadian right now? General health care is falling apart. $13 billion into something like that versus dental versus housing. These are equations that we do have to balance. Is it the top priority for Canadians right now? I'm sure for some it is, but for others, maybe not so. I'm in favor of universalizing dental care, but I do have to wonder if the time is right and if this will have the impacts that we hope it will. Once you break this down, 
by the number of families who will be leveraging the benefit, how much are they actually receiving each per year? Is it enough for the whole family to get dental care? Or will they have to make further choices? Will it be subpar? Maybe there are other approaches to this policy that would be more efficient. Maybe something to do with insurance companies and a partnership with the government to provide cheaper plans for those who are low income. Maybe something to do with collaborating with dental professional organizations and unions to develop a plan there. There are many different ways you can tackle a problem, and I'm not so sure this was the best. Now, next. Healthcare is getting a boost of more than $3 billion as part of the federal government's multi-year deal with the provinces, and there is why I mean there is a bit of a discrepancy. Allocating $13 billion just to dental, while only $3 billion is going to general healthcare. Now, of course, dental has no real infrastructure, so it's going to cost a little bit upfront to get that going, because this is a relatively new plan. But still, we're talking about spending something like 4x more on just your teeth, rather than looking at the healthcare sector as a whole. Is that a problem? It could very well end up being one. Next, there's going to be $20 billion over six years for tax credits to promote investment in green technologies. And that's more than the dental and the healthcare spending combined. Once again, is this a priority for Canada right now? To allocate $20 billion in tax credits to spur innovation in green tech? Or are there other market and business forces that could be leveraged to do the same thing? A question to ask. Next, we're spending over $4 billion over the next seven years for an indigenous housing strategy. Once again, a question to ask, is $4 billion allocated specifically to indigenous housing a good use of taxpayer dollars, or would a more general Canadian housing strategy be a better approach? In terms of housing, I think it's pretty clear that the most amount of Canadians would benefit from targeting areas that are exploding in terms of cost of living right now, such as Toronto and the greater Vancouver area. It seems like the government may not be prioritizing as aptly as we would hope they would be. In fact, when it comes to general housing, there's very little in this budget. It doesn't seem like it's a priority for the federal government. I don't think they're taking it as seriously as they should, but they're pretending that it's a priority. If it was, we would have seen a lot more initiatives, a lot more spending, a lot more thinking done in terms of producing a solution. Next, this is the one thing that I think is going to help some people, but not everyone in terms of housing. Financial institutions can start offering the tax-free first home savings account to Canadians starting April 1st, 2023. That allows you to save up to a maximum of $40,000 that will be tax-free and tax-deductible, and you can put that towards a down payment on a house. Will this do anything in terms of affordability? I'm going to wager not, because when everyone has access to the same tool like that, it may push prices up. It may help people who can already afford a house, It may help those who are on the cusp of affordability, but the average Canadian likely will not benefit that much from this initiative. Although I do think it is overall a good thing, but there has to be more. Next, there's going to be $359 million over five years for programs addressing the opioid crisis. I think that's an underspend. Drugs are a major problem across Canada. Many people are dying. Many people are losing their livelihood. Many people are losing their minds. To only allocate $300 million over five years seems like they're not taking that issue with the gravity it calls for. Next, there's going to be a spend of $158 million over three years for a suicide prevention hotline that's going to be launching in November. Here, I think that's a great thing, but I do wonder if there's an opportunity to partner with something like a kid's help phone instead of creating a new program. Next, there's going to be the creation of a new agency to combat foreign interference, and they're going to work closely with the RCMP. I do think we need that, and we'll have to see how the spending looks when that comes to fruition. Next, there's going to be a 27% reduction in the interchange fees Visa and MasterCard charge small businesses. Now, will these small businesses pass that on to the consumer? That remains to be seen, but if you're a small business owner, that should be some relief to you. Next, the budget is also offering $1.4 billion to the Canadian Space Agency so it can continue participating in the International Space Station until 2030. I personally like that. I do think space is our next frontier, and Canada should be a part of that mission. Now, in terms of the cuts, there's going to be $7.1 billion cutting from spending over five years on consultants, travel, 
at professional services. First of all, I'm surprised they have $7 billion to cut from consultants, travel, and pro services. That's astounding to me. And it makes me wonder how much money is left there. How is the federal government spending $7 billion on stuff like that? While it's good they're cutting it, I'm simply astonished that it was that high to begin with. Next, they're also going to cut departmental spending by $7 billion over four years and $2.4 billion per year ongoing after that. Once again, I am kind of shocked to see those numbers, but I'm sure the devil is in the details. And finally, the budget is going to promise Ukraine an additional loan of $2.4 billion for 2023. Now, just for comparison, the federal government is giving our provinces $3 billion for a healthcare system that's currently crumbling in Canada, and are offering a similar amount to Ukraine. Once again, the question has to be asked if that is a legitimate deployment of resources. Are we optimizing for what's best for Canadians right now? Of course, there is strategic incentive to support Ukraine, and I'm sure many people do support them, but when your country has crumbling infrastructure and many internal problems, you do have to ask how much can you afford to allocate. And further, as we talked about before, it's a matter of what you're doing there. I'm in favor of donating direct military supplies. Maybe some of Canada's old warfare artillery and gears and tanks send that off and we can upgrade our fleet. Sure, that makes sense. But is this a monetary loan? Are we just giving Zelensky $2 billion for him to do what he wants with it? If that's the case, I'm super against it. If we're going to be giving him things that could be used assets, I'm more in favor of that. So it really does depend what we're doing here. Now, that's all we're going to talk about today, but if you want to read the full document, as I said, it's quite long, and it's available on the internet. Now, with that, it does bring us to the end of our conversation for today. If you enjoy the material, be sure to leave a review and share. They'll help us grow. And you can find me online at periplatform.org and on social media at periplatform. Thanks for joining me, and I'll see you soon.